Just minutes ago, the FBI confirmed human remains found yesterday are Brian Laundrie. John Q. Public can't get it in their head that these areas were inaccessible. Talking about water levels up above almost the chest area. We feel that the Laundry family knows something and they need to come out and speak. What does it take to get a more in-depth look into the week's top local news stories? The debrief brings you inside for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our reporters every week, right here, right now. The debrief. Welcome to the debrief. I'm Paisy Cheng. We're back here in Northport, Florida, where we continue to cover the Gabby Petito case. We start today with news that has already made its way around the globe. News that Brian Laundrie's remains were found in the Carlton Reserve. The FBI tweeting that a comparison of dental records confirmed this. These two Northport police officers went to the Laundry's home this evening to let them know. Outside the Laundry home, people continued to stop by with flowers and notes saying justice for Gabby. The Laundry family attorney spoke with NBC's Tom Yamis. I'm sure every parent out there knows that uh, getting the getting the news that your, your child is no longer, you know, with you is sad under any circumstances. Uh, the fact that uh, the laundries have been subjected to these uh, people out in front of their house for the last uh, four weeks uh, and they continue out there today is just making it all the more difficult. Shelby Simonson isn't from Northport, but has been following this case closely. She is among the internet sleuths who couldn't have predicted this ending. I have dedicated my own personal time into this, so I'd love answers myself. And I know that the Petitos would love answers. And I think that a lot of America and the whole world who is watching want to see some kind of answer or retribution. And the question remains, will we ever know what happened between Laundry and Petito that led to her being found strangled to death in Wyoming? A notebook and other belongings found near Laundry's remains could answer those questions. The Laundry's, we, we sympathize with them because obviously we're parents, but also Gabby's parents. And, yeah. uh, you know, nobody knows how they would handle this thing. But there are some questions that we can answer. And for that, we're going back to the experts, starting with Joseph Scott Morgan from Jacksonville State University in Alabama. He's going to tell us how authorities ID'd Laundry's remains. Okay, so Joe, we spoke to you when Gabby's autopsy, you know, was revealed, but right. now we're learning new information about Brian. So these remains were identified today through yeah. dental records. Right. How accurate is that? Oh boy, it's very accurate. And can you let me expand on this and how significant this is? Sure, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, okay. Well, first <laughs> off, Dental ID has been around for a long time in our field. It's something that we can go to that is scientifically based. It's not like facial identification, that sort of thing, because you have pre-existing or anti-mortem records that would be at the dentist office. That piece of this is very significant, Paisy, and I'll tell you why. The fact that they were able to turn this around so quickly tells me, as an investigator, that they had already reached out to the dentist some time ago, when we have a body that is unidentified, we'll have to go through all manner of hoop jumping and this sort of thing to get records. Hey, did they turn this around in less than 24 hours? That is very significant. That means that they were sitting on go. My suspicion is the FBI, along with the local authorities, they went to the dentist. Sometimes the dentist will require a subpoena. Sometimes they're more cooperative, particularly if they know what's riding on something like this. And this is what happened. They had it standing by. And here's the other thing. They would probably have had to have called in a forensic dentist, otherwise known as a forensic odontologist. Now they deal in bite marks, but particularly they deal with unidentified bodies and examination of postmortem dental remains, which is what we're dealing with here. And they were able to very quickly turn this around and get Brian Laundry positively identified. So you're saying that it's very accurate because there are a lot of people on the internet, as we know, who are saying, oh, this is just another ruse. It can't possibly be him. But you're saying dental records, pretty much yeah, airtight. Let me, yeah, let me, and this is something people can grasp hold of at home. Everybody right now, think about the last trip you took to the dentist. It doesn't matter even if you've had braces when you're a kid, everybody's dentition is unique to them. And when you take that uniqueness that you're born with, and you put wear on those teeth over a lifetime, 
all of the rotations, malocclusions, all of the cavities that have never been treated, those that have been treated, tooth extractions, caps, bridges, all of these things, extractions of molars. I mean, how many of us have had our wisdom teeth taken out over the years? Each one of those points along that continuum are unique. That's why it makes it so very difficult. I would assume that people are saying that they have faked the dentistry in this. I have no idea. But that's why it makes it so unique to each individual. So unless some, I don't know, ne'er-do-well out there has access to uh, great science and they're able to go in and create some kind of faux dentistry, th this is him. It's going to be right on the money. Now, um, these remains, right, that they did, were described to us as skeletal right. remains, partial skeletal remains, and that even a part of a skull bone was discovered. Right. You know, one question that a lot of people had was, if you were in the preserve for, you know, let's say five weeks, right, if that's the estimated time, would, it, would the body decompose to that point where it's skeletal yeah. remains? Oh, yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Remember, we're dealing with high heat and high relative humidity. And for just step back for a second and think about when you were in grade school or middle school or whatever, and you first went into a science lab and they introduced you to a Bunsen burner or an alcohol burner. Remember, experiments in science start with heat, don't they? It, it speeds up molecular activity. The same principle in, in our context in forensics, a body in this environment, this harsh environment, which we're talking about here in, let's face it, Southern Florida, it's marshland, is going to decompose more rapidly, say, for instance, than somebody that's up on the Canadian border and where the temperatures at night tend to be cooler, you've got more of a, a middle ground there with temperature, you've got this kind of extreme outside of maybe a desert environment, it stays pretty hot. I mean, a lot of us that are viewing this, many of us have been to Florida, you know how miserably hot, great state, but you know how miserably hot it can get during the summertime. It's insufferable many times. And he's not on the coast. He's not near the beach. He doesn't have a wind blowing, all this sort of thing. It makes it very comfortable. No, he's in a marshy area. And the only way I can really describe this to, to, to people is imagine that you're maybe in a jungle-like setting. The floor is not exactly the same, but let's face it, it's hot, it's humid. There's a lot of greenery. You got a lot of low growth, and then you've got a lot of canopy in there too. So it's holding in the heat. And this is like being in a convection oven, essentially. And it, it mm. begins to render the body down over a period of time. Paisy, one thing that is very significant here that you were right to mention, they talked about these being partial, that this is like a partial skeletal remains case. Mm -hmm. That's significant because we have to begin to think about scavenger activity. We also have to think about what kind of toll the environment has taken on the body. Sometimes bodies will just literally come apart. We don't know what's missing. And also, we have to factor in the, this idea that they said the body was at least submerged or partially submerged. So now you've got current, potentially, at least a small amount as the water rises and falls or remains being swept away. I don't know. They haven't answered that question. And to mm -hmm. the final no. point, and, and this, is, this is kind of the thing that really grabbed me when I heard this. I'm glad you brought it up. They mm -hmm. talked about the skull. Now, Tell me again precisely what was it that they said about the skull, that it was what? They said it was a partial human skull. Partial human skull. What does that mean? Let's think about that. We have to include the jaw. Okay, so if we include the jaw in this, in this idea, was the lower jaw missing? Because it can become disarticulated at the TMJ, right? Okay, that's, that's standard. But also another factor, was there trauma? Was there trauma to one aspect of the skull that caused one of the areas, maybe the parietal area or the frontal area or the temporal area or the occipital area to literally come loose? You know, when we're being uh, formed, when, when in development, we have what are called suture lines that kind of fuse our skull together, okay? And sometimes those areas can become weakened, particularly in this very hostile environment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the skull will come apart. Well, and we have, as from a forensic standpoint, you have to look at this. Is the skull in a partial state, if you will, just give me a little latitude with that term. Is it in a partial state because there was some kind of antemortem, which means pre antemortem trauma that caused a, a defect in the skull? Or is this something that was postmortem, maybe 
animals involved with the skull that created the situation where the skull is only partially intact. That's one of the things that both the forensic pathologist and the forensic anthropologist are gonna be trying to determine back at the medical examiner's office and maybe at an anthropology lab somewhere where they can really study this very closely. They're gonna be looking at specific fractures, trying to determine and estimate how long this has been indwelling in the spot. Was it again before death or was it after death? So we're looking at the decomp, you know, this body was decomposed to a significant degree. Right. Um, do you think Brian was in this preserve the entire time? That's hard to answer, but I will tell you as a forensic scientist, that is certainly a question I would ask. I was thinking about this, Paisy, when the news came up. Well, we've been toying with this idea since we heard that they had found human remain. And I have to think, does this, does this marry up with the timeline when he was last seen alive? Is it possible to go downrange in linear time to try to decide if he has been down this long? Or was it a period of time where he may have I don't know, survived out there, lived for a while, maybe one to two weeks downrange, and then death was visited upon him either by his own hand or some accident, act of nature, or maybe some other person. I have no way of knowing. But that's something else that they're going to be exploring because I can tell you, people like you are going to be asking the ME and the forensic anthropologist those specific questions because let's face it, everybody wants to know. I want to know. I, I want to know if this does, Mary, up one of the biggest points of contention throughout this entire event has been the timeline, confusion, not knowing where he is, this idea, when was he last seen? When was he last spoken to? You know, and he kind of just disappears off of the face of the planet. And it's only going to be through science that we're going to be able to answer this question in the physical body. And also any information that say the feds currently have that we're not aware of relative to tracking him digitally. And I think that's going to be a key as well, because I don't necessarily know that they've released all of the information in their investigation. I would suspect they probably haven't. Now onto the search. How did authorities look for a month and find nothing? We asked Craig Kane, a retired U.S. Marshal, that question just hours before Laundrie's body was positively identified. I'm back here in Northport, Florida, as you can see. And, uh, you know, yesterday, you know, a couple of weeks ago, actually, you and I had spoken and you had said, you don't think he's in the Carlton Reserve and you think he's alive. So my now yesterday, you know, what do you think of that? We could speculate from now till the cows come home. OK, I, I didn't believe that he was. I believe he was in the preserve at some point in time, but I believe that he was being helped and I did believe that he was local. So that being said, there's a lot of moving parts. So let's just talk about how they found these items, okay? The police and the FBI have been searching what seems to be every inch of this 25,000 acre nature reserve in the past month or so. They haven't been able to find squat. One day, the laundry say, we're gonna go and look they bring the FBI there and they find a backpack, the other belongings of Brian's and some human remains. Everyone I've been speaking to says the timing seems suspicious. What do you think about that? It, it's very fishy to me, um, that whole scenario. It, it just kind of reinforces my belief that the parents knew where he was all along, um, you know, and this is just purely conjecture on my part, but mm -hmm. the fact that they actually brought law enforcement to that specific site kind of leads me to believe that whether they were helping him or not, that I don't know, but, you know, it's possible that they helped him in the very beginning when he first went into that preserve four or five weeks ago. They're going to cover every inch, every millimeter of that area where the body was found. Then they're going to gradually fan out and make, you know, like a perimeter um, at some point where they feel comfortable that that's going to be the end of where he could have been or 
um, parts of his skeleton or body has been found, but they're going to be looking for, like I said, any kind of material evidence uh, as far as, you know, how he might have killed himself. Did he leave any kind of, I, I heard he had a notebook. Did he leave any kind of uh, suicide note? Did he apologize for what he did? Was there, did, did it show any remorse? Because no matter what they find, it's still not going to bring closure to Gabby's family. They're never going to know, you know, what prompted him to kill her, how it was done, you know, why, where, and how, and all that sort of stuff. It, it, it would have been nice to capture him alive, and hopefully they would have got a confession out of him, or he could have given the family or law enforcement some kind of answers that could have brought some kind of closure to the family. Unless he left some kind of, you know, uh, testament, I, I just don't see how they're going to know the circumstances that happened in Wyoming. What we don't know is the condition of the notebook at this point. Um, if it was indeed submerged underwater, along with his backpack, like they're saying, um, you know, it could be illegible and you wouldn't be able to know anything from it. Excellent question. Yes. That was uh, another point that I was going to bring out. Um, You know, we don't know if he was in that particular area and then, you know, the flood came in, the water came in, it rained. Um, I just can't, unless he drowned himself, I mean, you know, that, that's also a possibility. Um, who the heck knows? Uh, you know, er- everything everybody thought about this case turned out to be a lot different. Look, like I always say, you know, investigators are humans. They, they're going to make some mistakes, possibly. And, and not that I believe there was any mistake made. You could search a house for a fugitive and not find him. And he's in the house. And that happened plenty of times with us. He's right under our nose, hiding in a crawl space, hiding in the attic. You know, we had we had people hiding under mattresses in between televisions. They had a hollowed out television set where this guy would crawl mm. into. Under, so that being said, uh, and that's just a house. Now you're talking about a nature preserve. The law enforcement could have walked past that area a dozen times and depending on the circumstances, might have walked right past him. It happens. Finally, where does the case go from here? Will we ever truly know what happened between Brian and Gabby? We talked to Wayson Dunn, a former FBI special agent with more than 30 years in the field. So where does the investigation go from here? I mean, is the FBI still going to be the lead investigator or does it go to Northport Police now because Brian was found here? Well, that's a very complicated question. Uh, As far as the FBI's involvement, I think a lot will depend on whether there are any potential additional federal crimes that might be investigated. If there are, uh, then the FBI potentially will stay involved uh, unless uh, all crimes that may have been committed are believed and suspected to be only committed by Brian Laundrie. But as long as there are investigative leads Uh, that have not been covered and potential crimes uh, that could still be investigated, there is a potential the investigation could go on at the federal level. The other possibility as well is that the FBI traditionally will assist state, local, and county police departments when requested to do so. So if there is any local investigation that continues uh, and they need some of the resources and tools of the FBI, Uh, that could continue FBI involvement as well. Uh, However, certainly from uh, the news reports I've heard, it sounds like uh, any investigation directly involving Brian Laundrie uh, probably has come to an end with the confirmation of his death. Really? So at this point, do you think that the FBI or any other investigative body would be able to find out what happened on this trip? It's going to be a real challenge. Um, I mean, first of all, there's the potential. There may be some uh, forensic evidence uh, and forensic leads that could still be followed, although that seems remote, quite candidly. Uh, The other possibility is if there are other eyewitnesses or people who may be tangentially aware of things, and uh, now that the case uh, has become more public, 
uh, if additional people come forward, potentially that could lead to a solution. Uh, but this is a challenging case and a very unusual case. Certainly if the victim uh, and the suspected perpetrator are both deceased, uh, that really limits uh, the ability to move the investigation forward. Wow, and what about the parents' involvement, uh, Brian Laundrie's parents? Do you think the FBI would be investigating You know what role they may have had? Potentially, if there is uh, an indication that they have been involved with a federal crime, or if uh, a state or local agency requests FBI assistance, that certainly would be a possibility. There's been a lot of speculation about that. The only thing I can say on, in that regard is that uh, the fact that it's confirmed uh, that Brian Laundrie is deceased uh, certainly uh, makes it more challenging. Uh, and, and one could say, you know, even if the parents were involved, it would be it would seem unlikely, I guess, that they would be involved in the in the death of their own son. But you never know. Well, not even just the, his death, but, you know, not like, did they know when he came home that Gabby was in trouble? Did they have an obligation to report that to police? That would be one avenue of investigation that may still remain. Um, that would probably uh, be more uh, on a state or local level. Uh, but again, if there is any indication that they were aware of or participated in obstruction of justice related to a federal crime, uh, then that aspect certainly could still be pursued. So really, I mean, at this point, if people are hoping to find out, and certainly Gabby's family wants to find out, what happened in Wyoming, right? What happened between the time that they last heard from her and the time that he came back to Northport? Is there going to be any way for them to find out? Well, potentially, uh, again, it's going to be really challenging. Uh, if there are no other uh, people that come forward that have information, if, if nothing is, is brought forth by someone else who has information, uh, the only other possibility might be a uh, forensic examination of digital data, forensic examination of cell phone data. Uh, but again, those are long shots. Uh, you know, it all depends on whether uh, the individuals had their phones with them, whether they were on or off uh, and, and things of that nature. So going forward, it's, it is going to be very, very challenging to move this investigation forward, if at all. Thanks for listening to The Debrief. Reporting here from Northport, Florida, I'm Paisy Cheng. We'll see you next week.